on this episode, a dramatic turn of events. I'm gonna eat crow egg in my face. <laughs> we reevaluate some of our code. And there is something that is atrocious about the way we do this. And we reevaluate our sanity. And I can shoot them down! You fools! My trap! Oh, hi everybody, this is Christian from LazyDevs. Welcome. This is the advanced schmuck tutorial. Whew, we've been working on a lot of, like, editor stuff for a long time. We uh, kind of figured out some basics on the spawning of our enemies. We're kind of like trying to get over this wall of shmups where you have to set up a lot of system to make the game finally, to be able to make the game. And we went as far with the scheduling stuff as we could. Today we need to go back to our initial game to kind of introduce a whole new system. We're gonna talk about enemy behavior. But first, there's some housekeeping I want to do before we get into enemy behavior, before we get into brains. Our game is pretty good. Uh, now we have like the spawning, let me show you. Yeah, we have like these beautiful formations that we can spawn. This is all the tech, this is all this tech that we set up. So we have the scheduled spawn system now. There is an enemy brain system, but again, some housekeeping. First of all, I wasn't quite sure what a good invulnerability period is and I checked I checked we I have currently set 120 I checked that um, GGLS 3 had um, had 150 so I'm just gonna use 150 as that value if that turns out to be wrong or too long or too short then you can still tweak it but it's I think it's a good idea to start with a value that is kind of like tried and tested right it's not necessarily the case that values from other games will work with our game. Maybe our, our game has some aspects to it that are different, that make it different from uh, GGLS3. But I think it's a, good, it's, a, it's a good idea to start with something that is already there. Something I said is that I, I want to optimize the schedule code and I never did that. So let me, let me get to the schedule code. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can already tell. Yeah, so here's we are in a um, up UPD game uh, function. And this is where we're spawning the enemies. Um, and yeah, okay, cool. Uh, here's where we're spawning an enemy. And there is something that is atrocious about the way we do this. <laughs> that one line is 17 tokens. Uh, I think we can make it a little better. One thing that is kind of like remarkable about this one line is that we're just like putting the we're basically putting like just the array in there, except for the first entry. The first entry that is kind of like the the spawn. That is the spawn time. We that is the thing that checks if we are about to spawn an enemy, and if we are about to spawn an enemy, we put the rest of that one array, that whole entry. We put everything starting from entry number two to all to the end. We dump that into a function. Now. There is like two ways which we can optimize it. First, we just like, if this, that's the only place where we're using this function, why is it even a function? Why do we don't we just put it, the contents of that function in this if statement? And that's what we might do ultimately. Uh, but for now, I think a good idea is to use the unpack thing that we learned from um, back when we optimized uh, MSPR. We used unpack to just dump an array into a function. Or actually there we, we used the unpack function to dump an array into helper variables. Now we can use unpack to dump an array into a function. But however, there's a small little problem, right? The small little problem is that we want to start at um, entry number two. And I don't think unpack has the capabilities of kind of like uh, constricting which parts of an array are being dumped into an array, uh, into a function. Whoa, 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 wait, we scratched that. I actually checked, oh man, look at this, look at this. I checked in our um, advertisement free, but a little bit, some people spammed recently, like there were some bots spammed recently, some kind of stuff in there. I deleted it all, but you know, <laughs> it's a constant gardening kind of situation. Anyway, it's our advertisement free wiki, pico8wiki.com. Um, and the unpack function actually does have the first index to unpack. Spicy, let's try that. 
I never thought that that this is something that that works. Let's try that. So unpack sked sked i comma two, and the rest is we're gonna leave 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 it as it is, just like this, right? So these fourteen tokens reduce just eight tokens. That's nice. Let's try this. Hmm. There's a there's a thing missing. Oh, nice. That feels good. Okay, so that worked. Now that we're here, I'm gonna eat crow. I'm gonna eat crow, egg in my face. <laughs> There's a movement code right here. And some people said, suggested to me that, hey, Christian, when you're drawing stuff, you're setting the camera to X scroll, but then you're resetting the camera and then you're setting it again. Like, hey, can't we just like set the camera once and then do all the stuff in this, you know, X scroll space in the world space? Why do why do we draw the the player differently? And I was adamant. I was I was I was sticking to my guns. I said like now I actually want to do the calculation of the of the player movement. I want to do it separately. I want to do it in screen space. I want to work on screen pixels when I calculate the position of the player. Um, because, you know, I, I want it to be smooth and I want it to be like really nice and precise. I want to avoid cobblestoning. And we actually, I wanted the, the radius in which our player is moving every frame. I want that to be nice and circular. I don't want it to be, to be squeezed. I, I want to be moving uh, uniformly in each direction. So the movement of the player is kind of predictable. And um, I, I in, the, in the past, I had problems where, you know, where I'm moving, um, there's subpixel movement on the player's position and subpixel movement on the background, on the scrolling. Then sometimes the scrolling and the movement of the player fight against each other. You get like weird cobblestoning like this. So I was resistant about, about that. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I did testing. I, I was second guessing myself. Thank you, everybody who, who can like um, suggested all this stuff. I think. I think it, it incepted me. And so there is one major change that made me change my mind. There's one major development that changed my mind. And that is the fact that we have a, now a player sprite. We have now a player sprite. So that kind of means that we are tracking the player's position in two ways. First, we have the PX and PY variable. That never went away. It's still there. We still have the screen position of the player saved in PX and PY. But then we dump it into like an object and then we draw that object. And this is an opportunity because this is basically just like a copy. It's just like it's a, it's a, it's a holder for just like a, another set of those variables. So this is an opportunity to apply scroll X here to kind of like bake in scroll X into the PSPR object, into this player sprite object. So we are track, keeping track of the player's screen position in our own like internal variables, but we then bake the um, um, scroll x x scroll. <laughs> we bake the x scroll into the actual sprite object, and draw that on the screen already in world space. And when I mean with world spaces, I mean like after we do the camera shenanigans with x scroll and so forth. I think it's a good opportunity. I tried it before; it worked, so maybe we can make it work now okay so uh, what do we well first of all let's do the payoff first so like what what is the advantage here like this line is just five tokens right and then we have like here two tokens here and five five tokens here when we just remove this we're going to remove this camera everything stays in the same camera space now we have to turn off the camera like reset the camera here but at the very beginning we are setting the camera we're scrolling the camera sideways and now everything is drawn like with this kind of like weird offset depending on you know how much we scroll the camera including the player ship but now kind of like player ship has to be kind of like undo the scrolling so to speak because the player ship is supposed not to scroll um, and in order to undo the scrolling previously we reset the camera but now we're not going to reset the camera instead we're just going to move the sprite a little bit and that's going to be here so here we're going to do x scroll uh, x scroll let's try that it will break so we can see a lot of things are, are, are wrong but you know it's working hmm but you see 
But you see, my worst fears came true. This is not looking smooth. This is not smooth movement. Ooh, this, this is a bit jerky. It's a bit jerky. What's happening there? Is that the, the cobblestoning that is happening? It sort of is, but there is a fix to that. You see, we're calculating the X scroll uh, after we do this. So the X scroll that we apply here, that is kind of like one frame behind, and that leads to a little bit of cobblestoning. Uh, it's just like a little mistake. We have to do calculate the X scroll before we do that. Now we're getting buttery smooth movements. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Now we just need to make sure that um, when we draw the flames that are drawn in the right position, right now they're not drawn in the right position. Why is that? Well, because we're working with PX and PY here. Uh, a little uh, easy fix is to make it um, work with a PSPR object. So we're going to go PSPR dot uh, X. PSPR dot X. Uh, we can keep PY here because that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of the same value anyway. Right. So now the flames are the right position. Why are the bullets shooting from the right position? Like what's happening there? Let's let's look. Uh, let's go here. Ah, because we are already um, bringing in X scroll. So let's see, this is seven tokens. What if, do, if we do PSPR X and then we can remove this? Six tokens, so that's a little bit. So that's saving one token, right? So let's do that. Or like this. Um, okay, so the shots are correct. Um, this stuff is all correct. This is good. Um, now there's one last thing that we need to fix. It's a kind of like very important thing to, to not to forget. And that is um, collision detection. Uh, we had like this kind of specialized collision detection function that you know, sometimes you could turn on X scroll, sometimes you could turn it off. Now we don't need that anymore. We can just remove this uh, because everything happens in the same space, basically, in the, in the already scrolled space. So all of this, this shenanigans with xscroll, we can just get rid of it. Everything is just working in the same space. And we can get rid of this code. Right, let's go to the update function when we're actually doing the code. So this, this last entry is can, can be removed. And hopefully I'm going to try to get hit by a smooth criminal. Do -do 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 -do. Boom, let's go, let's see if I can hit an enemy from the side. Yeah, that seemed okay, that seemed fine. Now let us talk about brains, about kind of like how to we set up a system where the, the enemies can have like some kind of like behavior where we can define different behaviors or different enemies. This is a bit of an issue and the issue is tokens. I mean, we are not hurting for tokens right now. We are kind of doing really well on tokens. There's actually a lot of superfluous code that we can actually remove, and we're around, you know, one maybe one fourth the way there. So we're kind of like good on the tokens. There's actually a lot of, um, you know, gameplay already in the game. There's just two major systems that we still need. That is going to be the the enemy behavior system, and there's also going to be the bullet system. However. I'm a bit worried about player behavior because that's one of those things that can easily, um, um, that, that needs a lot of code if you hard code everything in there, right? There is like, if we um, make different brains and we program those brains using uh, Pico8 code, using Lua in here, each enemy will take up tokens and there's just so many enemies we can do. This is especially problematic with uh, uh, boss fights, right? You remember in the basic Schmuck tutorial, we programmed the boss fight and had like multiple phases. It, each phase had like different behavior. You had to do like huge like state machines where you know, there's like mode one, mode two, mode three, and then there's like animations happening. This is a lot of stuff. And I'm worried that we will, that will this will cost us a lot of tokens and that we might not even achieve a lot of enemies, right? So we might actually want to create some kind of system that will allow us to create whole sorts of enemy behaviors, which are kind of like variations on some or, um, you know, um, universal code, right? There's some kind of like um, universal brain behavior, basically, some, some kind of like algorithm, and you feed it some data, and then you get different behaviors based on the kind of data you feed it. In order to create like this universal brain engine, <laughs> 
uh, we first have to kind of like think about what kind of behavior do we even want? What What's the things that uh, enemies in those games are kind of doing? And for that, I gave you the task for the doggy zone to play through one level of a shmup and do like a catalog of enemies and like look at all the different enemies, how they behave, what they do and you know how they move. I hope you did that because I sure did. Let me show you. All right, so this is my analysis of a uh, shmup. The shmup that we're talking about here is called um, Esperate. It's uh, one of the cave shmups. I played it a lot when I did this. So I had like, um, I was already familiar with the first few levels. So I was able to just like um, go through those levels and like analyze this, the footage. That's actually, I had to record it because you cannot do it while playing the game. And I actually, you know, made like little drawings of all the enemies so I can see how many any enemies there are and how they behave. So I kind of make like a little comic of showing, you know, how the different enemies behave. And I wrote down notes, observation that I, that I noticed. Later on, um, I also looked at the game LSGG3. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second. All right, so what are my observations? First of all, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12-ish enemy sprites. Um, I, there's a placeholder here, there's actually more tanks. There's actually a lot of tanks in this game. Uh, but yeah, kind of like around this amount of uh, different enemy sprites. But something I noticed, and it's kind of like a big takeaway, is that these small enemies, the popcorn type of enemies, there's actually different types of behaviors for the same enemy sprites. So you have one sprite, but different brains. Um, so we kind of, our system that we have right now is kind of already supporting this kind of like idea that you have one enemy um, visual, one enemy sprite, but different behaviors uh, for this enemy. Why is that with the case with the popcorn enemies and not so much with the bigger enemies? Uh, I think it's so, because like the, those enemies are appearing in large quantities and if they always behave the same, it would be a little bit boring. Also, I feel it makes the enemies feel a bit more uh, smart and as if they're trying to um, try new strategies, you know, um, and they don't feel as robotic that way. So there's actually a lot of very interesting behaviors. For example, like a very basic behavior is an enemy flies in, it kind of hovers in place, shoots at you, and then it does like a curve motion flying away. There's also other variants. This one is kind of like really weird because the it kind of like does a kamikaze run at you. It kind of like goes towards you and shoots at you, but then it also misses you at the same time. So it's not necessarily always colliding with you. So it, this is a little bit of a weird behavior. That I'm not sure how to replicate if we wanted to replicate this. Broadly speaking, there's actually not as many uh, air enemies as there are ground enemies. The ground enemies are actually like the most common types of enemies. And also the ground enemies are kind of like boring in terms of behavior. They will just basically just do, um, drive to a location and then just stand there and shoot at you until they disappear at the bottom of the screen. So there's actually not a lot of interesting behavior with the ground enemies. There are very interesting bullet patterns with the ground enemies, however. Especially the bigger ground enemies, they have really interesting like spread patterns that are happening. We're not going to try to replicate this behavior, but it's actually a good test for our system, for our behavior system and later on for our bullet system to try to, try to replicate some of those uh, enemy behaviors to see if our system is capable enough to support a shmup of this, you know, of this type. Additionally, I try to kind of like in terms of to get like a grasp on the design of things, I try to kind of like understand the different enemy roles, the types of enemies that you have in this type of game. So I created a typology of different enemy types kind of to understand, to kind of clump them into clusters. Um, so one uh, enemy type would be like the Zako or popcorn enemy, whereas basically uh, enemies that kind of like appear in large swarms and, and put the player under pressure. Uh, another one is, I call, I call them Chunker, which are these like big, big enemies. Specifically in this game, it was interesting to see that the big enemies, the chunky enemies, they actually have really boring flight patterns. They would usually just like fly from the top of the screen downwards, maybe accelerate a little bit along the line, but basically just fly straight. And I think one of the reasons for this is maybe also maybe because of the game mechanics of um, Esperate. Uh, one of the core mechanics in Esperate is to, to execute like those special attacks against enemies with a lot of uh, health points. So I think this game is very keen at showing you those, you know, static big targets that you can, 
use your special abilities on. But I think also another goal for those chunker enemies are, is also just like to um, have screen presence, to have something on the screen that occupies the player. So while they're focusing on taking down this big enemy, um, they are um, you know, not taking care of the rest of the screen and then maybe um, they can get swarmed by, by other enemies. So they're kind of like distractions to some extent. Then I have an enemy type called spread chunkers. Some, some of the, I call them spread chunkers. So some of those enemies that we have here, for example, this one here, um, it is a big, big chunky enemy, but also it's an enemy that also, or, or for example, this one, it's an enemy that shoots those streams of bullets, diagonal streams of bullets that um, block your ability to cross to the other side of the screen. So you kind of have to take down this enemy to, uh, to have access to the other side of the screen. So what they are doing is basically they are denying you access to areas of the screen. And then I have this uh, fourth enemy type, which is a sprinkler. I call them sprinkler, <laughs> which is kind of like, for example, this tank here. These are enemies that are just like saturate the screen with bullets. They make it difficult to move around on the screen. And the final enemy type that I would maybe categorize is like an event enemy. These are rare enemies that maybe come up once in the entire game. They're not really bosses, they're kind of like defeat them pretty quickly, but also they are highly memorable. And you kind of like, you understand the level based on them, basically. You kind of remember that, ah, you know, uh, in the middle of the level, you get this one unique enemy. They're very memorable experiences. And one good example for that is like, there's like this huge gun at the beginning of the first level in Esperate, and there is just like one location where this gun exists. And when you blow it up, um, it uh, destroys the roof of a building. And then there's like small tanks inside that building. It's like a very memorable experience. It's an interesting, you know, spread pattern that this gun is firing, but it's not necessarily like a boss enemy. Right, so I was kind of like a bit surprised that I didn't see that much variation in terms of movement, especially among the big enemies. So that's why I also went to a different game to kind of like compare. And in this game, in LSGG3, I saw a lot more variation with enemy, enemy movement. And I think this is partly also due to, due to the fact that LSGG3 cannot create as many bullets on the screen. So it cannot like saturate the screen with a lot of bullets and create interesting patterns through the bullets. So it has to make the enemies do more work. So here you have like these very snaky kind of enemy types that you see in a lot in older games where they, they have like these trains of enemies go, doing like crazy loops or you have enemies that fly in and then go sideways while shooting at you and then they maybe later fly away. So here I saw more variation. So that might be more of a inspiration for our game, but it kind of really depends of what kind of game we're trying to create. But this analysis in general gave me like a good understanding of what kind of behaviors enemy have in shmups and also, you know, what kind of roles, what kind of typology uh, of enemies there are you could see in a game like this. So this is my typology, but I created this typology way before there was a famous YouTube series, now a famous YouTube series that just came out uh, from um, the shmup creator called Mark Hawk. He created something called the Shmup Workshop, multiple videos of really, really cool insights about how to create shmups. And Mark Hawk has his own uh, typology, kind of like different enemy types that he identifies. He identifies, um, first of all, pressure type enemies, uh, enemies that exert pressure on the, on the player, force the player to move around because they shoot at them or get in their grill. Then there is clutter enemies, so clutter enemies that make it difficult for the player to move around, kind of like the opposite. One player and one type of enemy forces you to move, the other one makes it difficult to move. Pressure and clutter. And then there is uh, enemies who are doing area denial, which literally prevent you from accessing certain parts of the screen. And finally, he also talks about enemies that are called the direct challenge, which are enemies that are kind of like integrated, already stand alone, um, encounter on their own, like kind of like a boss fight, but not really a boss fight. And there are some parallels to my typology, to my own, you know, newbie kind of typology. Um, this area denial is kind of like what I identified as the spread chunker. Again, uh, not giving you access to the screen, to certain parts of the screen until you defeat the enemy. Clutter is what I would call the sprinkler, something that, that uh, puts bullets everywhere. Uh, and you could say that a lot of enemies that are uh, popcorn are kind of like pressure type enemies. And the, uh, the event 
enemy is also something that you could call the direct challenge. So there's some parallels, although the way I formulate things are different than, than he does. And that's great. Like everybody thinks about these things differently. And you should do this as well. Do not necessarily follow other people's typology. You are free to create your own typology. You have your own tastes. You have your own things that you, uh, you know, pay attention to. And those will inform the way you cluster certain things. The only thing that's really important for us is to actually start doing this, start actually thinking about, you know, what enemies are actually doing and what their purpose is in a game. That's the important part. Right, so after I'm looking at this stuff, what is our takeaways from this? Oh man, um, it's, it's difficult to create like a universal system that will cover all of the different things that I've seen in those games. So initially, uh, my idea was, as I said, maybe to create like a system that is gonna, you know, there, here's the fly in behavior, here's the lingering on the screen behavior, and here's the fly out behavior. And you can maybe customize it from where, which, which speed we're flying in. You can maybe customize, you know, here's how, how fast an enemy is moving when it's lingering on the screen or how long it's lingering on the screen. And then you can specify in which direction it flies away. But most of the enemies can't be really broken out down this way. They kind of have always a bit weird behaviors that are not really comparable with each other. So instead, what we're going to have to do is kind of a scripting system. Yeah, we're we're in dangerous territory now. So there's there's two things that programmers are bound to get lost in. One we already, one danger we already encountered. The danger is to create an editor, and then the project becomes the editor, and then you never go back to the original project because you spend your t all your time developing an awesome editor for a game that you never will create. And the other danger is that if you are a programmer, eventually you want to invent your own languages. Instead of working with existing one, you say like, ah, there's some things that I don't like and I will create my own engine and it will be so much awesome. And then you will be just working on making that engine work and never actually get to use it. And you know, it's not like programmers are kind of like unique. It's, it's in all, in all creative endeavors, there's like a tendency to kind of like do the Ouroboros thing where writers eventually start um, or like to write about writing and movie makers like to make movies about movie making like the entire oeuvre of Christopher Nolan for example right like each one of Christopher Nolan's movie can be understood as a labored metaphor for movie making or cinema <laughs> so what I want to say is yeah we have to make a um, simple scripting engine uh, I think that pays off, um, but also we have to be careful not to overdo it. We have to make it as easy, as simple as possible. Here's an idea that I have. All right, so how about, so basically what we have to do is we have to kind of encode behavior in data because uh, tokens are expensive or are precious. We, we want to preserve our tokens. Data is also precious, but not quite as precious. We can put in a lot of data, as we said before, as we had before, we can put a lot of arrays into text files and they will use up a resource, the compressed size resource. But we have more of that resource probably than um, we have uh, tokens. So if we can somehow encode complex behaviors in data, in like an array, and then we have just some little code, some little, you know, interpreter code that interprets the data and makes um, the enemies behave based on some data. Um, that will allow us to create a lot of different enemies, a lot of interesting behaviors without using a lot of tokens. So here's an idea that I have for a scripting system. There's going to be lines of code that our interpreter will execute. There's going to be a command and there's going to be parameters. And I think two parameters is all we're going to need. So like just one command and two parameters. So something we could, for example, do is like heading, right? We can we can set like set a heading for an enemy, and then we're going to create like an angle, and then speed, right? And that will set a speed for for an enemy that will go at a certain angle on the screen with a certain speed. Um, I said angle and speed. Currently, we're working with X and Y to describe a position of an enemy or a speed or an enemy. We're going to go speed X and speed Y, right? We have some, we, we, that's how we work right now. I think I want to change the, the different system where we have an angle and a speed. Um, we had that already in, uh, in a basic schmuck tutorial when we did the bullets. I think it's worth doing this for enemies as well.
Um, and for the simple reasons that I, when I did the research, I saw like a lot of like swooping curves and that's difficult to pull off with, uh, if you separate X and Y, if you describe motion by describing the X speed and Y speed, it's difficult to make a curve like this. But if you uh, separate things into an angle and speed, it's easy to make a curve. You keep the speed constant and you just animate the angle and that will give you a curve. So yes, each enemy brain will be just an array that contains, you know, three, um, three entries after each other, always three entries, triplets of entries that um, um, issue different commands to the enemy. All right, so what do we need to do in order to, to make the system work? Well, first of all, we need to have like a um, heading speed system. That, I think this is something that we should do today. Um, and then uh, we need brain database system. We need to kind of like have like the um, logistics of, you know, how the different commands get to the, to the individual enemies. And then we want to create like the interpreter, uh, which is kind of like the code that will look at the commands and execute the commands and change the information of the underlying enemy. And something that we also want to make sure is that uh, we want to actually, we're not doing that right now, uh, delete enemies. Once they're finished, like we have to somehow recognize that enemies have left the screen or something and then delete them afterwards. Uh, let's call it delete old enemies. The interpreter is going to be like the major point because we have to kind of think about what um, what kind of what commands what commands do we need? The nice thing about having like an interpreter, like a universal interpreter, is that um, um, we can expand it with our own commands. If we ever feel like we want our enemy to do something that is not possible with the current set of commands, we can add a command. And uh, so this is kind of like a very flexible system. But again, it's dangerous. We are we are making our own coding language, so to speak. In Christopher Nolan's term, if we stay in limbo for too long, we're not going to get out again. Right, so let us um, do this first part here where we want to change our enemies, the way we animate the enemies and move the enemies around. I want them to be working with heading and speed. Right, so let's see where the enemy is um, starting. Here's where we're um, spawning an enemy. And then uh, we don't need... Oh, wait, actually we do need... No, we don't need that anymore. We are now spawning enemies where they belong. What is N, X, and Y? Oh yeah, we're spawning enemies at certain locations, obviously. Cool. Um, so we have an SX and SY. Something I would do here is also, we want to keep SX and SY around, but we also want to have an ang for angle. Uh, let's put it, I don't know, 0 0.5. And then also have a speed and let's set it to one. And then we're gonna calculate SX and SY based on ang and speed. Uh, let's remove this bullet thing for now. Okay, so here's the brain. And this brain goes through multiple phases. I'm just gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm just gonna remove this. I'm just gonna remove this. I'm just gonna remove all of this. No brains for the enemies anymore. Um, we do want to make them move based on SX, but also now we want to calculate SX and SY. And we did that in the basic schmuck tutorial. So we're gonna go e.sx equals um, sign ang, oh, e dot ang, multiplied by e dot spd. So, um, and then this one is gonna be cosine, right? Uh, sy is gonna be cosine, ang and speed. So we are taking a sine and cosine from the angle and we multiply it by the speed. This is broadly speaking how it works. This saves us this, um, y and, and x speed and we can add them to x and y we could probably just like skip the s x and s s y but i want to keep this them as a middle step because you know this is my old programmer brain it's like i i in the olden times sine and cosine were incredibly processing intensive so uh, later on if if that's actually something that starts bogging down um, the execution speed, something we can always do is we can only calculate SX and SY if the angle has changed or if the speed has changed. Then we have to recalculate the speed. But if the speed doesn't change, then there is no reason to do a sine cosine every single frame, right? So let's just keep this as a middle step uh, around. So let's see if this even works. Maybe we should spawn an enemy earlier, just so I don't have to wait for the... <sighs> 
I don't know if they even appear. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do not appear. Uh, so maybe the angle was wrong. Let's 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 make it angle zero. Oh yeah, there we go. See now they're moving nice and and uniform. Uh, so something we can now do is we can mess around with that angle. Let's let's make it zero point one. Let's see how that works. Now they should all go diagonal, or uh, slightly at at an at a at a at an angle. Yeah, there we go. They're going uh, sideways now. Cool. So now we, our enemies are base are kind of like have these hookups to speed and angle. Let's make them go uh, slower. Now they should be really crawling. Yeah, there we go. Going nice and slow. And I can shoot them down. You fools, my trap. You ran into them. I can control your behavior. Ha 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 ha. Why do they have so much health? <laughs> Some of too much health. All right, the stage is set. Let us move on to the dog zone. That's right, the dog zone. <sighs> yes, the stage is set. We are wiser. We have a plan to make the brain work. And so obviously, the dog is on. The task for the dog is on is going to the next step. We have the heading in speed, but now we have to create like a brain database. We did it a lot, a lot of other things before. So, you know, here's a task for you to set up, you know, your array for the brain database, um, create like an include for that, create maybe like already like a first editor for that. That's going to be the task for the doggy zone. And if you're all already feeling lucky, then maybe you can also already start creating your own brain interpreter. That would be a cool challenge as well if you are up for it. Yes, yes, yes. And this is now the part, as always, at the end of each episode where I say a big thank you, huge shout out to all the people who are supporting this show on coffee.com. I am really grateful that more and more people are chipping in and, you know, supporting my work here on YouTube. And if you want to do that as well, the address is coffee.com slash lazy devs. And I have also some questions that I wanted to maybe answer. Um, here's a question on Discord from Heraklum. Actually, my doubt curiosity watching the last episode is, I'm not quite sure which episode this refers to, but uh, is there a reason for a specific checks? Like if nil, if think is not equals nil, then or if think uh, equals nil, then versus respectively, if think, then if not think, then. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. It's, it's, I'm, I'm glad that, that, that I've been called out like this. Broadly speaking, no. Um, in the Lua, uh, if something is set to nil, uh, that is basically like the same as if it's set to false. And if it's set to any value other than false, um, then that's as if it's set to true. It is a little bit, uh, I think you save one token if you don't use the equals equals nil or not equals nil variation. So that's an argument for doing like this more broader check. Um, the reason why I generally, I am a bit wary, like I have a personal distaste of doing like if the, the check for if not think, right? I, I don't like doing that because I, I am afraid of the not. <laughs> I'm afraid of the not. Um, the problem is that quite often uh, I want to say like, if something hasn't been set at all and something else, right? And using not in conjunction with and or using the not in conjunction with or inside an if statement, I never know what comes first. And I'm too afraid to check or too lazy to check. <laughs> lazy death, right? So, um, and then you have to use brackets if you want to make sure and that cost token. So then you can just as well do like the, the you know, specific check for nil. And that's make, that makes me a lot more calm about, uh, you know, what comes first and next. Um, maybe I should just like look it up and see what, what comes first, not or end. And yeah, do call me out if there's some cool places in the code where you can save a bunch of tokens if you use a more concise uh, code, then do let me know. Yes, brains. We're gonna get into them next episode. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.